One time state president of the Dean's Association of Indiana, she has been an active member of Altruista Club International, the American Association of University Women, the League of Women Voters, Tri Kappa, Phi Gamma Mu, and the YWCA. And she's just joined another study group. <laughs> Okay, I think that Ms. DeHorty will tell us a little bit about the history of the Sun Hall. Um, yes, I joined the study group so I couldn't come on Wednesday. I didn't know that I was cheating myself out of the dinner, but I was very well fed tonight anyway. Um, are, who are, how many seniors in this group? Well, there'll be three of us. <coughs> the Sun Hall was, uh, if you can't hear me, please lift your hand, because I don't know where I got this hoarseness. Maybe uh, it came on me as I came over here. <laughs> it's a cold air. Cold air, maybe. In the fall of 1927, that's before you were born, we opened the Sun Hall. Um, it was a hot day, and it had been hot for some time and very sticky. The parlor, which was the, the rooms out there, were fresh painted and the paint didn't dry. <laughs> so <coughs> we had planned, as the girls came, and a great many of them were freshmen, and we're all going to come on the same day, and they came the same hour also, <laughs> um, <coughs> to have them put their luggage. And if you've ever observed it, college girls bring everything they have at home. <laughs> so there was lots of luggage out on the terrace. Well, it poured down rain. <laughs> so we had to come into the sticky uh, parlors with all that we had. And I suspect things didn't run too smoothly because people in charge were not used to sorting out that many girls. I think there were a hundred and some and assigning them to rooms. And of course the freshmen, as you know, if you can remember when you were a freshman, uh, <coughs> are a little reluctant. I think freshmen then were more reluctant than they are now. Well, <coughs> we got settled and the rain continued to pour. And we didn't have any light. The transformer was to be put in a hole uh, in what's in this little court now. See, all of this building was not here then. And there's water in the hole. And the men didn't get any light. Well, there were a good many mothers here. <laughs> and a good many freshmen. And uh, the mothers were more reluctant than the freshmen. <laughs> <laughs> and, but some of the freshmen did cry. But after a while, when it was good and dark, we did get some light. The dining room was in the room below this room at that time. The room at the far end was a recreation room. And the building stopped well, back of where the desk is and across. And this area was rooms. Just like the rooms above it and the rooms across. When we, um, well, I'll tell you that later. <laughs> I think you might be interested in how the hall got the name Lucina. Lucina is the name of the Ball brothers' sister. The Sina Ball was the oldest child of seven children. There were two girls and five boys. Their father died when the youngest one was about eight or ten years old. And the Sina took over and she kept the family together. Uh, Miss Elizabeth Ball has a good many letters that Lucina wrote to these young men as they grew up and went out various jobs. They had very little means. There was no millionaire among them. 
Lucina, uh, never married, and uh, was a teacher all of her life. She uh, taught in public schools and uh, in academies and uh, was a director of Drexel Institute. There have been two Lucinas since that day. Uh, Mrs. Owsley, who's known as Lucy Ball, name is Lucina, but she's always been called Lucy. And then William Ball, a daughter, was named Lucina. And Lucina Ball was a little girl when this building was put up, and she used to come over and play the piano for her. She plays the piano very, very well. She lives in Indianapolis now, <coughs> and uh, she doesn't need to, but she does give music lessons just because she likes to. <coughs> when we first had the Sina Hall, every organization in Muncie wanted to come here and have a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it was the uh, nicest looking building, and uh, we had pianos and nice furniture, and uh, we had to finally say no, nobody could have a meeting in that parlor except the girls who lived here, in order not to have some difficulty with the citizenry. Now the rooms downstairs have been used for a great many things. As I said, the room below this was the dining room, and we used to sit and eat and be served and learn which fork to use and so forth and so on. The room at the other end was a recreation room until uh, Forest Hall, which was a little frame building that stood out here, L-shaped, was torn down. It housed the cafeteria, the school cafeteria, and then when it was torn down, it was a cafeteria <coughs> over in that room, which was not too pleasant have that smelly thing down there infringing upon our uh, privacy. But we had to have a cafeteria and that was the place it could be. And then when the Elliott Hall was built, the cafeteria was moved out and that was a recreation room <coughs> again for anybody, any organization on the campus that wanted to use it. Also the girls in the hall. The little room at the end of the stairs could tell a lot of interesting stories if uh, it could speak. It was used as a just a, sort of a store room, and then it was too nice a room to be used that way. Then it was used for um, a date room and um, a retreat and a meditation room. And what do you do with it now? And when we had the cafeteria, it was an overflow room. We could go in there and eat, too, as well as in the other. I do not remember <coughs> the year, and I'm sorry I do not. We had a very, very cold winter. Uh, it was below zero every day in January and nearly all of February. And the city water mains <coughs> were not put in for that kind of weather, so they broke. And believe it or not, in the Sina Hall, the only place you could get a drop of water was in the basement. Now, I tell you, we belong to the great unwashed. <laughs> <laughs> the form bucket brigades and girls standing on the landing and on the stairs with buckets and pass the water <laughs> on upstairs and it was slow getting because there was just a trinkle. Well as soon as there was enough fall, the college made a second connection with another water main so I don't think there's any danger of that happening now. Uh, as far as I know there's never been but one wedding in this hall. Uh, Mrs. Worden was professor of education, was the director of Forest Hall. And uh, one time, just before the, I don't remember, the Teachers Association vacation, our Thanksgiving vacation, um, Mrs. Worden was married to Mr. Broadhurst. 
see, all the girls had gone home, and just a few choice friends were invited to the wedding. It was very simple, very pretty uh, wedding, and she was a lovely person. Did you ever know her, Selma? No, I did not. Oh, she was the most delightful person. In, uh, near the end of the Depression, uh, before the Second World War, we received word one day <coughs> that there was a possibility of receiving some money to be used on the campus uh, for building purposes. And after some hurried meetings, it was decided that we'd extend to a sign of home. I think we had less than a week to get ready plans and costs. And uh, I believe it was seven copies had to be sent to Washington. Well, a number of people on this campus work day and night to get the material together. And if there's uh, some bungled up nonsensical things in the rest of this building, you'll understand why. <laughs> It wasn't very easy, as you can imagine, to join on another wing. One of the things that we missed, and I see you're still missing it, no back door in the garbage cans that out there. I don't know if you see them or not, but I did. We got the plans made and started. The uh, workmen worked while the rest of the residents lived in the hall. So you can imagine what it was like, dust and dirt and men. Men are very <laughs> charming in their right places when they're wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to join it on. Well, we knew we'd have to have another parlor if we were going to increase the population that much. So these rooms, this space, was cleared out and um, made into this room, which I think is a very charming room. That bay window was in a room. You see the hall, you remember how the hall goes in the other car the corridor goes in the other room. And the two girls that had that room were just as mad as hard. <laughs> and you can't blame them because I don't know how to get rooms now, but uh, we used to assign rooms by seniority. You see, if you lived here, by, then you were ahead of somebody else in the choosing of your room. And those two pretty maids were just living in heaven in that choice room in the whole campus. And along we come and say you had to move out. <coughs> Only two girls lived in a room at that time. Well, we finally got the building finished. When this room was ready to be painted, we were having quite an argument about what color. It was going to be, and what kind of paint it was going to have on it. Uh, the architect, the dear soul, <laughs> uh, was the. Um, he had very elaborate ideas. He wanted stippled, I guess that's the word that you use. Well, the rest of us wanted flat because we felt it was so low in the ceiling and little. So he got sick. <laughs> and while he was sick, we painted the place. <laughs> <laughs> <They coughs> we had an open house. It was open in the spring term. We used that outside door, had the line in here. Everybody who wanted to could come, a great many parents came, and all the boyfriends, <laughs> to look over the whole place. We had some special meetings. We had a district-wide WCA meeting, and were allowed to use the some of the space, and we had a fine time. Of course, we had some problems about being crowded and 
And I often think about some of our grumbling, how different it is now, <laughs> how much worse. <laughs> <laughs> but we were going along in our usual way, <coughs> having some very good programs here. The girls who live in the hall, so before and after it was extended, had some very interesting programs. They used to sing a great deal, which was easy when you had that one dining room, always uh, on Wednesday night or whatever night they had their special dinner. There was group singing, there was a, a uh, blessing or thanks a song written by uh, some girl. She told me tonight she found that song one time. Um, the Christmas and Thanksgiving programs were always very interesting. <coughs> uh, sometimes I remember one Thanksgiving they had a Thanksgiving program and that was nice only you had to get up very early the girls did a good deal of caroling and um, a number of things that were nice but after the war started one uh, hot summer day we received word that the United States government would like for Ball State Teachers College to house 401 soldiers. Now, if there was only one place we could put them, that was in the front hall. <laughs> <laughs> the Elliott Hall had been built in the meantime, and um, <coughs> it was already occupied with about 200. Um, Air Force men. Now we were delighted to have the men because they were scarce. <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, most of the men who were in college had gone into the service. They'd been drafted. They had to go. And there were just a few men around. And uh, of course, as you know, all of the vigorous ones were taken into the service. But housing them in the Sina Hall was quite a different uh, matter. And <coughs> what to do with that many girls? Well, girls really were good sports about the whole situation. A number of them just volunteered. They'd commute. You don't need to have room for me. I'll commute, which was very commendable. Uh, people who had not kept students opened their uh, houses to uh, students. And we were working very diligently to get everything cleared out and set right. And we were expecting about Monday to have this army come. And on Friday afternoon we heard a tread, tread, tread and looked out and there were the 401. <laughs> very handsome men. <laughs> they were exceedingly a fine man. I say that in all sincerity because it was a group of young men who had been selected from two or three different camps to be put in officer training. And of course they were choice people. They were um, had high scholastic standing, they had uh, fine physiques, and they were the kind of people that would make officers. Well, we weren't very glad to see them. But I must say that if I ever had any ill feeling or said anything uh, about them, I apologize. Because they were excellent young men and we had a delightful time having them here. They had a commandant that uh, was wonderful. The very first day he was here, he came to the administration building and said, now we're going to have a committee of men that I will select to work with a committee of women students on a social program, which was very delightful. I've never worked with finer people than those young men. Most of the committee was changed uh, once a week. 
The girls on the committee were girls who held various kinds of positions on the campus, officers of various <coughs> organizations. And we met once or twice a week and planned a party and had a party. Every Friday and sometimes every Friday and every Saturday night in the gymnasium. It was a nice, delightful party with wonderful young men. One very cold, stormy day, after these people had been here for many months, word came that they were to be sent to the front. And they marched away in a snowstorm. And some of these books, there ought to be some pictures of those people leaving us. That was a very sad day for a good many reasons. Men. One very cold, stormy day, after these people had been here for many months, word came that they were to be sent to the front. And they marched away in a snowstorm. And some of these books, there ought to be some pictures of those people leaving us. That was a very sad day for a good many reasons. And it became sadder because a good many of those young men um, were lost in the Battle of the Bulge. Well, we had to get all put together again and all re-inhabited. Uh, when we knew that they were coming, uh, some of us were very apprehensive about what would be left after 401 men lived in this place. But if you won't tell anybody, you won't tell any men, they took better care of it than any girls ever did. <laughs> uh, you'd think they'd wear the carpet out. They'd scuff the floors. Well, they didn't. They weren't allowed to trail through the. And when you're in the army, you do what you're told. Their rooms were inspected twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't looked at any rooms today, <coughs> but I have in the past, and I, uh, well, we just don't keep house like they kept house. Everything was in perfect condition. If we had time, and my memory was better, we could spend a good deal of time talking about some people who lived in the Sina Hall, an outstanding young woman. Here's one of them. Miss Hyde. Um, one young woman who lived here, I think, had as much influence on the <coughs> group as any one person who ever lived in the hall, and that was a blind girl, uh, Mary Helen Wyrick. She'd been blind all of her life, or since she was a child, baby. And she came to Ball State, and finally we had a room for her in the hall. She roomed alone. There was a little room, I don't remember which floor, that opens on the court. But that was Mary Helen's room. And it was the cleanest, most orderly room in the whole place. Of course, Mary Helen had to know where things were. So she couldn't just drop things hither and yon because she couldn't see. But her influence was excellent. She was a little older than some of the other girls and was uh, a wise counselor and very much beloved person. I don't know what's happened in the last few years, but looking around at the condition of the place and the appearance of the girls, I think it must be very much as it has been in the past. It's very nice to be here. If you have any questions that I could answer, I'd be glad to try. Um, the one thing I was wondering, the grandfather clock that is back there, well, somebody gave us that. We just had six, and I was wondering where we did get it. And the, the pianos were given to us. Um, Lasina, the last Lasina uh, ball, grandmother gave us one of the pianos. 
And I think some member of the Ball family gave another one. I don't know whether they're the same pianos or not, because that's been quite a long time. And of course, you all know that that's the sign of Ball, that relief out over there. And this was in her memory, which was a very lovely thing for them to do, because she was mother and father and sister to the young man who came here, the five brothers, and made themselves a lot of money. Thank you very much, Steve I believe that uh, we have some coffee for anyone that would like a coffee. And probably if you would like to talk to the audience informally here, we, <laughs> we have been talking very informally, but just come up and talk to you. <laughs> 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 we recorded, you knew that, didn't you?